Hi, this is Anna McLaughlin. I am a statistical scientist at Barry Consultants, and the topic of today's webinar is flexible sample sizes. So I'll be talking about trials where the sample size of the trial is affected by the accruing data that, um, that we see in the trial. So the outline of the talk today, first I'll begin with an example to motivate why we might want to consider a trial with a flexible sample size. And I'll use that example to walk through adding early stopping rules to our trial, either for success or for futility. And I'll discuss using simulations as a tool that we can use to evaluate the behavior of our design and to help us to make choices about um, the properties that we wish to have in our design. And I'll conclude with a summary. So why might we consider a design with a flexible sample size? Whenever we are developing um, drugs in our program, we have many questions that we'd like to answer, but limited resources available to answer them. So a question that we want to ask is, how should we best allocate our resources? Um, and at the beginning of our trial, when we're designing it, we have some uncertainties. So we may have uncertainties about the size of our treatment effect, about whether there's a treatment effect at all, and about nuisance parameters. So for example, if our outcome is a continuous measurement, we might have some uncertainty about the variability in that outcome. Or for a dichotomous outcome, we might have uncertainty about what's the control rate. So when we design our, sample si our, our trial and we pick a sample size, um, we have to consider these uncertainties. If we could learn about these things while the trial is ongoing, um, then we could have a better idea of how to right size our trial. So the goal of a design with a flexible sample size is to make use of that accruing data that we learned during the trial to help us get the sample size right. So I'll start with an example. So consider that we have um, a trial where we have a dichotomous outcome. So each patient, their outcome is either their responder or a non-responder. And on the control arm, we anticipate that we'll see a rate of about 30% responders. And we hope that our treatment arm will achieve about a 50% rate of responders. So a 20% absolute benefit on the treatment arm. So if we use our sample size calculator, we find that a sample size of 200 subjects, 100 per arm, gives about 83% power. And this is under an assumption of a 2.5% one-sided type 1 error rate. So we're done, right? We have our sample size. So I have a little quiz for you. So play along. Suppose that we run this trial. So we actually accrue 200 subjects, 100 of them on the control arm, and 100 on the treatment arm. And at the end of our trial, we observe 30 responders on control and 50 on the treatment arm. So we've achieved exactly that 30% versus 50% rate that we hypothesized at the beginning of the trial. So what do you think is the one-sided p-value for this observed data? Is it more than 2.5%, equal to 2.5%, or is it less than 2.5%? So I hope that you've got an answer fixed in your mind. It turns out that if we observe this exact data, our p-value is actually far less than the 2.5%. It turns out that it's 0 0.0016. So if that's the case, why did we need a sample size of 200 subjects? Couldn't we have gotten by with something less than that? So to help us understand this behavior, um, we're going to use clinical trial simulation. So in the table, what I've done is use the computer to randomly generate data from our clinical trial. And I've told the computer that the true rate is 30% on control and 50% on treatment, just as we're hypothesizing to occur in our trial. But the computer recognizes that there's going to be random variability. So what I'm showing you in the table is one example trial. And I'm showing um, not only what happens at the final analysis at 200 subjects, but also what happens at different earlier points in the trial. So the first row shows the data at 100 subjects. The second row is at 150 subjects. And you'll see that the next two columns show the data that we observe on the control arm and on the treatment arm. So you can see at the first, uh, this first look here at 100 subjects, 
we have an unimpressive difference between 44 and 50 percent. And the last two columns show an analysis. So the, the standardized test statistic or the z-score and the corresponding p-value. So in this particular trial, by the time we got to a sample size of 200 subjects, our p-value was less than 0.025. But at these earlier looks, we can see that the p-value was above that magical threshold. So we might look at this table and think that the sample size of 200 subjects is the time where the p-value becomes significant. But it turns out that's not usually the case. So on the next slide, I'm showing another example trial. So I've plugged in the exact same assumptions, and this is just another iteration. So in this trial, we can see that the, the data was very highly significant well before sample size of 200. So even very early on in the trial, our p-value was well below the 2.5%. And this is not very uncommon. Um, we see this happen a lot in clinical trials. But on the other hand, sometimes the p-value never becomes significant. So here's an example trial where throughout the trial, um, the p-value remained above the 2.5% threshold. And we also see that the p-value is not monotonic in this scenario. So sometimes it's going up and then it goes back down. So that was uh, three example trials. On this slide, now what I'm showing is the results of 50 randomly simulated clinical trials. So the graph on the far right is showing the results of these 50 trials. So each line in the graph is one trial. And on the x-axis is a sample size. So we're seeing what happens to these trials over time. And the y-axis is the standardized test statistic or the z-score. Here, higher values um, are better, so indicating a bigger treatment effect. And for reference, we're showing these three lines that indicate the corresponding p-values. So you can see that bottom line is the p-value of 0.025 that we need by the end of the trial. So what we can observe from this graph, first of all, there's large variation. Um, so not all of the trials behave the same way. Uh, some of these trials, they start out um, with a very low z-score, which increases over time. So for example, this red line you can see um, was not significant early on, but as we increased over time, by the end of the trial, this p-value had crossed the 0.025 threshold. There were some other trials that were very highly significant early on in the trial and stayed that way. And we also see some trials that fluctuate, that go up and down. And at the beginning of our trial, we don't know which of these paths our trial is going to take. But we do observe from this graph that most of these trials reach significance far before 200. So remember, this is the line that we're looking at, that 0.025. And quite a few of our trials reach that threshold before 200. So why did we pick 200? Well, the sample size of 200 is selected so that by the end of the trial, we have 80% of our trials that have reached that significance level of 0.025. So essentially, we're waiting long enough for that to have happened. But clearly, a lot of these trials had low p-values long before that. So essentially, when we choose a sample size of 200 subjects, we're buying a very expensive insurance policy. We're paying for subjects that we often don't need if we happen to be in one of these cases where we reach significance earlier. And this is under an assumption where um, we've assumed a 30% versus a 50% rate. This problem becomes even bigger when we have uncertainty about what our treatment effect is. So for example, this is a power curve uh, for this design where we assume a 30% control response rate. You can see if our treatment effect really is a 50% response rate. That's where we get that 80% power for our 200 subject sample size. But what if we have some reason to believe that our treatment effect is bigger than that? Maybe we actually believe it's a 55% rate. Well, in that case, our sample size of 200 is well overpowered, um, something close to 95%. So if we really believe that, do we need 200 subjects or could we get away with fewer? Should we be powering the trial for the minimum effect that we think is meaningful, or should we be powering the trial for 
um, a more optimistic effect that we think is achievable. The idea behind a trial with a flexible sample size is to get the right size of the trial. And we do that by performing interim analyses on the accumulating data during the trial and using pre-specified rules to adjust the sample size. This could be decreasing the planned sample size. For example, we could stop a trial early for success or for futility. Or we, uh, we could have rules that increase the planned sample size. So some examples that we'll talk about in the remainder of the presentation include group sequential designs and Goldilocks designs. These are typically designs that um, have rules to stop accrual early for uh, success or futility. Sample size reestimation and a promising zone design, these typically fall under that later bullet of increasing the planned sample size. So I'll begin by talking about designs that stop early for success. Um, a very common design for this is a group sequential design. The idea behind this type of design is to have sequential looks at the data at pre-specified interim analyses. So for our trial, we have a sample size of 200. We might consider having interims at a sample size of 100 and 150, or we could, be, um, we could have interims on a more frequent schedule, for example, every 20 subjects. And the things to consider about how many interims and when to begin the interims um, may be operational, um, and there will always be a trade-off between how early you look um, and how often you look in terms of the, the expected savings and sample size. So with a group sequential design, our rule will be to declare success at an interim if the p-value is less than some threshold, which depends on the interim. So um, if we're going to have multiple looks at the data, we can't use the same 0.025 threshold at each of our analyses. Um, because we're now looking at the data multiple times and we have the opportunity to win at each of these different interims, we've introduced a multiplicity. So in order to control our type one error rate, we'll have to adjust this threshold for each interim. So there are some uh, very well-described methods for doing this. Uh, two of the most common are using Pocock or O'Brien-Fleming boundaries. Um, in the Pocock boundaries, we would use the same threshold for all of the interims. The O'Brien-Fleming boundaries tend to have different thresholds at each interim, um, and they're structured to be more conservative early on. So in order to win at one of these earlier interims, you require a much more stringent p-value. And as the trial um, moves to the later sample sizes, that gets relaxed. There are also a class of functions called alpha spending functions that are used to construct these boundaries. And with these functions, the type one error rate is spent at each interim according to how much information is available at the interim. So here information could be the number of subjects with known outcomes. For example, um, you know, how many subjects do we know whether they're a responder or a non-responder? If we have a time to event trial where our outcome is something like survival, here the information would be measured in terms of how many events are observed. So if we go back to our example, I'm going to add group sequential looks for success every 20 subjects, starting with 100 subjects enrolled. So now in the table, you'll see at each of these interims what p-value is required in order to, to meet the criteria for success at that interim. And these p-values were constructed using one of these spending functions, in particular a Kim Demet spending function, where the amount of the type one error that we spend at each interim is a function of how much information is available. So you can see at the first interim look, we require a p-value less than 0 0.0031 to meet success. If we don't meet success at that interim and we continue, you can see that the p-value threshold is relaxed. And by the time we get to the 200 sample size, if we haven't stopped earlier, um, then our p-value threshold is 0 0.0183. So now we've added a, a line to the table 
to describe the behavior of the design. So if we assume that our true effect is a 20% difference between treatment and control, what's shown in the last line of the table is now the probability of stopping for success at each one of those interims. So for a sample size um, at our first interim of 100 subjects, almost 30% of our trials stop at that interim. So if you think back to that picture where we looked at the Z scores over time, this is saying that about 30% of those trials um, had a p-value less than 0.03031 at that first look. If we add up um, all of the numbers in this last row, that would be equal to our power. For this trial, this group sequential design, uh, we get 81.8% power. So remember, if we had just done our fixed design with 200 subjects, our power was just over 83%. So our power has gone down slightly by adding these interim looks. But the trade-off is also that our expected sample size has decreased. So for example, 30% of our trials stopped at the first interim, so with a uh, sample size of 100 subjects. And if we take the weighted average over all of these interims, we see that our average sample size is 148.3 subjects compared to the 200 if we had just used a fixed sample size. So with the group sequential design, we have a slight reduction in our power, but in trade-off, we get a reduction in our expected sample size. If we're concerned about that slight reduction in power and we want to get back up to the 83%, we could consider increasing the maximum sample size to compensate. So that's what we'll do next we'll have a slightly increased maximum sample size and we don't have to increase it much. So instead of 200 as my maximum sample size, I'll change the maximum to 220 subjects. Um, so we've adjusted our thresholds and you can now see those required thresholds in the first row. And now the second row is showing our power. For this design, our power is 85%. So we've regained the power that we lost before and, and even a little bit more. So by just a 20% increase in the maximum, we've gained back that power. Um, and in fact, our expected sample size hasn't increased by all that much. So recall that for our earlier design, it was 148.3 subjects. We're now at 156.4 subjects. And another important thing to note is that under this design, only about 21.5% of our trials even reach 220. So most of our trials are going to remain um, smaller than our original sample size of 200 subjects, and only a, few, a small number of them actually go larger. So I've summarized that information now um, visually. So on the left is our power curve. So on the x-axis is our true treatment effect. The black line shows the power for our fixed trial, which had a sample size of 200. And the orange line shows the power with our new group sequential design with a, a maximum sample size of 220 subjects. So you can see that for our treatment effect of a 50% response rate, our power under the fixed design was about 83%. And now with our group sequential design, it's about 85%. And on the right hand side is showing the expected sample size. So with a fixed design, our sample size is always 200 subjects. With the group sequential design, the sample size depends on the, uh, the true effect. So as our true effect increases, the sample size decreases because we're more likely to stop those trials early for expected success. So what can we do now about those trials that have a small sample or a small effect? Is there a way that we can also get out of those trials early? So next I'll talk about designs that have the ability to stop for futility. So futility in its simplest form just means the inability of a trial to achieve its objectives. So when we are running a clinical trial, um, we may wish to stop the trial at an interim if it's unlikely that that trial will ever reach its objective, even with continued enrollment. So this could happen for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be that our trial has um, 
had very slow accrual. It's been difficult to recruit patients. It could be that something external to the trial has occurred that makes it no longer feasible. But what I really want to focus on is a design that has pre-specified rules that are part of the design um, in order to stop the trial early for futility. So the reasons that we might want to do this, first and foremost, is for the patients. So if there is a treatment that isn't working, uh, we want to limit the number of subjects that are exposed to that treatment that they're not likely to benefit from. But also, in terms of our resources, um, if we can get out of trials early that are unlikely to win, we can then redirect our resources into more promising avenues. But when we're doing uh, any stopping rules for futility, we have to also weigh that against the risk that we stop a trial early for futility that may have gone on to success. So we'll talk about that and how we can mitigate that risk. So let's consider an example where we have a trial that we wish to power at 80% to detect a difference between a 35% responder rate on control versus a 55% rate on the treatment arm. So if we use our sample size calculator, we come up with a sample size of 192 subjects, which is 96 per arm. So for this design, in order to reach significance at the final analysis, we would need to actually observe about a 15% improvement. So now let's suppose that we're running this trial and we're two thirds of the way through. So our current sample size is 128. And we observe the following data. On our control arm, we've observed 21 responders out of 64 subjects. So that's about a 33% response rate. And on the treatment arm, we've observed 25 responders out of 64 subjects. So about a 39% response rate. So the difference here between our observed response rate on treatment and control is a 6.3% rate. So this is considerably smaller than that 15% that we know we need by the end of the trial. And in fact, if we compute our p-value with the current data, it's 0 0.2306. So well, well above that 0 0.025 that we'll need. So a question is, can we still win this trial? We're two thirds of the way through, and we know that by the time we get to our final analysis at 192 subjects, we need a p-value less than 0.025. And as we saw before, that requires about a 15% observed effect. But currently, we only have a 6% effect. So is there a way for our trial to still win with only a third of the trial left to go? In fact, what that means is that the remaining data is going to need about a 33% effect on those remaining subjects in order to get that p-value less than 0.025. So sometimes it's helpful to think about this in terms of a sports analogy. So let's pretend that you're watching your favorite sports team um, and they're playing a game and they haven't been doing so well. So it's at the end of the third quarter and your team is behind. So what's the probability that they can come back and win the game? Well, the game's not over yet. They haven't lost yet. There's still some time left that they could come back and win, but you know that they haven't been playing that well so far. So in, in the context of our clinical trial, um, we're gonna have to see a pretty amazing comeback in order to win. And the way that we measure those probabilities in a clinical trial is with predictive probabilities, which directly measure the probability of winning at the end of the trial, given what we know so far. So predictive probabilities incorporate the uncertainties that we have about the remaining data. So we have, for example, subjects that haven't enrolled yet. Um, we may have also subjects who have enrolled but whose outcomes we don't know yet. And predictive probabilities uh, naturally incorporate our uncertainty about how those outcomes are going, going to turn out. We also have uncertainty about our estimates of the parameters. So currently in our trial, we have observed about a 6% um, treatment effect. But in the future subjects, we may not see exactly a 6% treatment effect. It may be slightly higher than that. It may be lower than that. And predictive probabilities naturally hand handle that source of uncertainty as well. If we were to take our, our current data in our trial and compute a predictive probability, it comes out to about 
So in order to win the trial, um, we're gonna have to have a pretty remarkable turnaround. So now let's go back and uh, rewind the clock and pretend that we're designing this trial um, at the beginning and want to add a rule for futility at a sample size of 128 if the predictive probability is too small. So how do we go about choosing that threshold? We saw in our current trial that, that, um, that our predictive probability was about 6%. So is that small, too small? Is that uh, not small enough? So as we're choosing a threshold, um, our tuition might tell us that if we choose a low threshold um, to stop for futility, what that will mean is that trials that ultimately are going to be successful shouldn't meet that threshold. But we might make some mistakes and some trials that, um, that ultimately would have been unsuccessful, we may not be able to stop for futility. So if we were to raise that threshold, we would do a better job at stopping those unsuccessful trials earlier, but we may also then accidentally stop some trials that would have gone on to be successful. So as we're choosing this threshold, it's going to be about finding the right balance. There's not going to be a perfect rule that makes the exact right decision every time, so we'll have to weigh the benefits and the risks. One way that we can do that um, is through clinical trial simulation. So what I've done is I've simulated this trial. Um, here's showing the data, um, both at an interim analysis and at the final analysis. Each one of the dots on this graph represents a single simulated trial, and the dots are color-coded according to whether or not they meet the success criteria at the end of the trial. So if they have a p-value less than 0.025, they're green, and if the p-value is above 0.025, they're black. The x-axis here is showing what the data looks like at the interim analysis, and the y-axis is showing what the data looks like at the final analysis. And you can see that there's a pretty clear cutoff at the final analysis between the trials that are successful and not successful. In fact, it's a 15% observed difference between our control and treatment effect um, that, that makes that cutoff. So next what I've done is I've taken those dots and I've summarized them according to the underlying truth. So I've simulated some, um, some trials where there is truly no treatment effect and some trials where there was a large treatment effect. The middle graph here is showing um, the proportion of trials that are successful under our different scenarios. So for example, if we really do have a 20% true underlying effect, the height of this green bar corresponds to the power, and we can see that that's about 80%. On the far left of this graph, this is under the assumption that there's no true treatment effect, and the height of this bar is about 2.5%, and that's our type 1 error rate. The table that's on the right is then just summarizing those numbers so you can see the concrete numbers that go into the graph. So now what we're going to do is introduce a futility rule. So now I'm going to say that at our interim analysis, if our predictive probability for eventual success is less than 1%, we're going to stop the trial for futility. So now looking at our graphs, you can see that we've introduced some new colors. So notice that some of those dots that used to be black, remember those were trials that fail at the final analysis, have now turned blue. These are trials that now have stopped for futility at the interim analysis and would have ultimately gone on to failure. So this is a good thing. We've been able to stop those trials early. In the middle graph, you can see what proportion of those trials we stop early. So under the null, you can see a little bit over 60% of our trials we were able to stop for futility that would have gone on to be unsuccessful. We do also stop some trials in our other scenarios, but again, these aren't necessarily bad things. Um, if these were trials that were ultimately going to fail anyway, then getting out of those trials earlier is a good thing. But you can see on our graph, we have also introduced some pink dots. So these are dots that used to be green. They were trials that were going to be successful at the final analysis that have now been stopped for futility. 
But with a threshold of only 1%, you can see that this doesn't happen very often. And in fact, across all of our simulated trials, it was less than 1% of the time. So in our table, um, this row that's called feudal would have lost, those correspond to those blue dots, and feudal would have won, those are the pink dots. The table at the bottom of the graph now shows our expected sample size. So the top row is showing how many of our trials stopped at the interim analysis. And so you can see under the null scenario that about 60% of our trials stopped for futility. And the remainder of those trials went on to our final sample size of 192 subjects. So on average, when there is truly no treatment effect, our average sample size is a is 128, or sorry, 153 subjects. Now what I'm gonna do is start increasing that futility threshold. So from 1%, we've now gone to 5%. You can see we've increased the proportion of blue in our, in our graph, which is a good thing. We've also increased the proportion of pink dots. And as we continue to increase this threshold from 5%, 10%, 20% or even 50%, you can see how those proportions change. And 50%, um, you can see that we're now starting to make a lot of mistakes. So under the scenario where we truly have a 20% benefit, 10% of our trials that would have been successful have now been stopped for futility. And that directly corresponds to the loss in power so remember that for this scenario, we originally had about 80% power with no futility rule. If we use such a large threshold as 50%, our power has decreased and it's now down to only 70%. The other thing that we'll notice um, is that our expected sample size goes down in accordance to how strict our threshold is. So as we back up, and if you take a look at that bottom table for the expected sample size, in particular under the null, with a 1% threshold, our expected sample size was 153 subjects. And as we continue to increase that threshold, you'll see that our expected sample size goes down. So one of the questions that often comes up anytime we have designs with interim analyses is do we spend alpha? So we saw with our group sequential design earlier, when we have interims that allow us to stop for success, we have to adjust our, uh, our thresholds at each interim in order to control our type one error probability. But when we have interims that only have the ability to stop for success, we do not increase our probability of making a type one error. In fact, futility actually decreases our type one error rate which we can see from our plots. So remember that without a futility rule, our type one error rate was two and a half percent. As we increase our futility threshold, that probability of success under the null actually goes down. So we don't incur any kind of statistical penalty for futility interims. But as we also saw, having the futility does decrease our power because we do have the uh, potential to uh, stop a trial for futility that would have gone on to be success. So there are other methodologies that we can use to stop for a trial for futility. I've talked about the predictive probabilities. Um, the group sequential designs like we talked about earlier, um, you can also use group sequential boundaries for futility as well as for success where the uh, condition is based on a p-value. Similarly, you could use Bayesian posterior probabilities to do the early stopping. There are also methods based on conditional power. And some other bells and whistles might exist as well. For example, if you have a trial that has multiple arms, maybe multiple doses that you're considering, you may wish to construct arm-wise futility rules so that if you have um, one or two of the doses that aren't performing well, you could stop those doses for futility. And in this example, I've only shown having a single interim about halfway through the trial, but we can actually introduce multiple interims to stop for futility. So now I'm actually going to go back to the previous example that we had, where we used a group sequential design to stop early for success. And I'm going to now introduce a futility rule to this design as well. 
Um, I'm going to use a similar kind of futility rule that we just described using predictive probabilities. So at each one of these interims, we'll stop the trial for futility if the predictive probability of eventual success is less than 5%. So our table here has now added an extra row down at the bottom. So now we're showing not only what's the probability that you win at each interim, but now also the probability that you stop for futility at each interim. So you can see that now with our futility rule, our power of our trial has decreased slightly. Um, so with our original group sequential design, we were at about 85% power. The introduction of our futility rule has decreased that now to 83.3%, which is um, exactly the same as our fixed design that we started with. Also important to note that under this design, only 10.6% of our trials actually go out to the maximum sample size. And 78.6% of our trials actually stop before 200, which was our original sample size. So under this design, the expected sample size has been decreased to about 150 subjects. Now, the numbers in this table are shown under the alternative hypothesis, which assumes a 20% absolute difference between treatment and control. We actually see even better behavior here under the null hypothesis when we add the futility rule. So now the numbers in the table were um, constructed under the assumption of no treatment benefit. And we can see here approximately 80% of our trials stop quite early. Actually 80% stop before 140 subjects. And about 60% stop at this very first interim for futility. And under this null scenario, our expected sample size is down to 123 subjects. So on this slide, I'm now summarizing our new design. So again, on the left is our power curve. You can see that it's nearly identical to our original design with the fixed sample size of 200. And when we look at the right, the average sample size for our new design, which is shown in blue, um, we can see that under, the, uh, under assumptions where we have no treatment effect, our average sample size is small. Under the assumption of a very large treatment effect, our sample size is also small, and it's in these more moderate effect sizes that our, our sample size increases. So when we think about designs that have early stopping, um, an important consideration is how, what we're doing with our resources. So suppose that we have to fund a population of treatments and we're trying to design our trials for all of these different treatments. Um, let's assume that in truth, about 30% of those treatments work and about 70% of them don't work. Now in reality, it's not um, a distribution quite like this. It's a little more complicated, but our point remains the same. So if we design a trial with a flexible sample size, we were able to obtain the same power that we did for a fixed sample size, but on average, our sample size decreased to about 131 subjects. So what this means is that for the same overall um, number of subjects in our program, we can fund about 52% more trials. And the reason we can do that is we're not paying for this expensive insurance policy for every single trial when we don't actually need it for every single trial. So by stopping early, we're better able to use our resources to answer the important questions. So the design that I've presented uses a kind of a hybrid approach where we use group sequential boundaries for success stopping and predictive probabilities for futility stopping. But certainly other choices are possible. Um, there are group sequential designs that have success and futility stopping based on p-values. Um, there are designs where both the success and futility stopping are based on predictive probabilities. Uh, and that's typically referred to as a Goldilocks design. The idea being to get a design that's not too big and not too small, but just right. So some of the benefits that we see for designs that stop early First of all, are the ethical advantages to patients both inside and outside the trial. So we saw that when we stop a trial for futility, we're protecting um, those subjects um, who aren't going to benefit from the drug. Uh, 
Um, but early success stopping also has the potential to benefit patients outside the trial because we're able to make our decisions earlier and get those treatments um, to the patients sooner. We also are better able to allocate our, our resources and redirect resources to other clinical questions when we're able to stop a trial early. And these designs also uh, have the benefit that they naturally account for uncertainty in our treatment effect um, so that we are better able to plan our trial and mitigate our risk uh, of missing a, an important treatment effect. Some of the risks that come with these types of designs First of all, anytime we have interim analyses where we can stop for success, we introduce a multiplicity and we have to then account for that, um, those multiplicities. That can be either recognizing have, having a decrease in our power or we can increase our maximum sample size to compensate for that. Designs that stop early also will yield less information, um, particularly if we're interested in subgroups um, we might have less data available in each of those subgroups if we stop early. And we also must recognize that there is a need to gather safety information, and a design that stops early will have less information about our, our important safety endpoints. There are also some potential concerns about statistical biases. So anytime we look at a subset of trials that stop our, our, for success, um, there are biases that are introduced. Um, so if we're looking at trials that stopped early for success, it's possible that the estimate of our treatment effect is an overestimate and that if that trial had continued enrollment and continued gathering data, that that treatment effect might start to attenuate. And there have been methods developed that can account for and adjust those kinds of biases. So I briefly wanted to mention other types of designs with flexible sample sizes, in particular designs that increase the sample size. Um, so for example, there's a design called sample size re-estimation, and the idea behind these types of designs is to adjust the sample size during the course of the trial to adjust for an estimate of some nuisance parameter. Um, so for example, if we're running a trial with a continuous outcome, um, a nuisance parameter might be the variance. And if the variance has changed or is different from the assumptions that we made at the beginning of the trial, um, we may find that it's necessary to increase the size of our trial in order to attain the same power. Uh, these types of designs are often performed in a blinded fashion. Um, and it's important to use appropriate methods such as combination tests to preserve the overall type one error rate in these kinds of trials. Another type of design that uh, has an increase in sample size is a promising zone design. And the idea here is to increase the sample size when the observed effect is in a, a range of treatment effects that's considered promising. So some other considerations to be aware of if you're planning a clinical trial that has early stopping rules. First of all, pre-specification is in uh, is important. So we're not talking here about designs where we make ad hoc changes to the sample size. It's important that these rules and how they'll be conducted is written down, it's part of the protocol and part of the design. Another thing to consider is whether there are some constraints that need to be built in for a minimum sample size and a maximum sample size. So in particular, recognizing that there may need to be some minimum number of subjects um, or a minimum amount of follow-up time in order to evaluate safety endpoints. And this could be a very important discussion to have, for example, with regulators if you're planning your trial. Um, as you're planning your, your design, uh, it's also uh, important to think about how many interims you're going to do and when they occur. Um, so we talked a little bit about that minimum sample size, which can help dictate when to perform the first analysis. Um, but then there remains the question of how many interims should be done, how frequently they should be done. Uh, some of this may depend on operational considerations and how quickly the data is coming in. So in these types of designs, the accrual rate is very important. Um, so if you're accruing very quickly, it may not make sense to do interims uh, very frequently because there may just not be a lot of additional information that comes in. Another thing to consider is how to handle overrun subjects. 
So these are subjects that enroll during the interim. So for example, if you have an endpoint that's observed 12 weeks after uh, the initiation of treatment, and you know that you're going to do an interim analysis after your 100th, sub 100th subject has completed that 12-week follow-up, you may have some subjects that accrue during the time between when that 100th subject enrolls and the 12 weeks um, when that, uh, that uh, go by before you do the interim. So how should you handle those subjects in your analysis? Um, there have been some methods developed for group sequential designs. Um, the Goldilocks design naturally accounts for these subjects with predictive probabilities. But it's important to think through how you're going to do that when you design your trial. There are also some operational considerations that you should be aware of. So when you're doing an interim analysis that involves looking at the unblinded data, you typically want to limit this information to a small team of personnel that's, um, that's responsible for running the interim. And typically these need to be personnel who are independent from the day-to-day -day trial activities. So these are not um, individuals who will be having direct contact with patients or with the site. Um, and the amount of information uh, that is communicated needs to be pre-specified and the plan for how things get communicated needs to be thought through. So you'll need to have a plan for who gets to know the results and when do they know that in order to minimize the potential of any operational biases and to preserve the overall scientific integrity of the trial. So in summary, designs that have a flexible sample size uh, allow us to make the most efficient use of our patient resources. We can end our trials early once we've answered the question and then use those savings to redirect to more interesting or more promising questions. There's no one size fits all design. So each of these um, designs has different um, bells and whistles and the design that is selected and the thresholds that you choose depend on factors such as the nature of the disease, whether other therapies are available for these patients, and of course, financial considerations as well. Uh, you should be aware that there's an FDA guidance document that was recently released in draft form, and that can be a very important resource for you uh, if you're planning or considering doing a trial with these flexible sample sizes, in particular if a trial is planned um, for uh, regulatory interactions. That's all I have, and thank you.